Wasilition? Yep. yep. All right, so we're talking this week with Nikki Wasilition, and she's got an insane story that when I first heard of it, I was like, well, that's clear cut. Yeah, really. And simple. Yeah. But guess what? The legal system doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's not clear cut and simple. Not like when you were a kid and right was right and wrong was wrong, right? Right. So, um, so Nikki's here to tell us her incredible story, and I've been waiting on pins and needles to hear about it. So, Nikki, go. We, go. Yeah, it, it, it has, oh. we can't just get in the story just yet. Oh, why? Because oh. The, what we do on our podcast is we do discuss uh, the food that oh, we I thought, I thought we were doing it backwards. Okay. No, right. no. We, we have All to right. talk about the food because we wanted to include Nikki with the food. So, when I first spoke to Nikki, uh, over the phone to like figure out this appointment or appointment this what is this this podcast. interview I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. hopefully it's a little more pain a little pain more painless than an appointment but um one of the things we do is we ask about the food right yeah. like we eat food here and you know I kind of try to leave it into the guest's hands about like what kind of food do we, did your mom like or did you guys have together do you have some sort of memories that we could reflect yeah because food with the food elicit memories and yeah absolutely and like it's the core of our of every culture right, right? and every like family and whatever right so she wasn't 100 percent sure about the food initially but she got back to me and so we had a we had a stir fry mm-hmm. which was one of her mom's like favorites i guess or specialties what would you say favorite yeah I mean she was a pastry chef so she was always in the kitchen baking so I'm there was a I had to talk to my aunt Wendy and there were several different dishes but Wendy chose stir fry because that is something that they grew up on you know it was cheap to do at the house and mom just carried on with it with the kids so yeah traditional so we had, you know, chicken stir fry chicken stir fry yes it had peppers and mushrooms and broccoli and all of that stuff with over white rice how it was, was it? So yeah, it was so good. <laughs> I was really, thr- I love a stir fry. I love a stir fry. Honestly, is there any other meal that you can just throw together that comes together in less than 15 minutes that's also healthy? Yeah, and it also, right. Like, yeah, it feels healthy. It right. feels fulfilling. It feels a little like, ooh, we're having Chinese food tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it feels exotic. Yeah. You really just throw it in there. It's just a stir fry. It was, it was great. But um, it doesn't cost a whole much to make, you know, like what did you make? 20 bucks on it for a meal for everybody. I mean, that's perfect. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can't beat it. Um, yeah. Also, you can throw it together in a couple of minutes after work, right? Like if you got mm-hmm. a, bunch a of couple of small kids at the house and yeah, that's great. She sounds like a smart lady, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that she mentioned was she loved to make cookies with her mom. Mm-hmm. And so her mom would make cookies. She was a pastry chef. She probably made lots of good food, but um that we that she would eat the cookie dough Mm -hmm. with her mom you know so uh cindy made us cookies so we had chocolate chip cookies but she also made left us some cookie dough so we had edible cookie dough also uh, in honor of your mom uh, stomach problems this week (laughs) she cut off the egg and i was slightly disappointed (laughs) (laughs) i was like (laughs) You know, I don't know. I felt that maybe I shouldn't poison my host here. And so I found a recipe that did not include the eggs that you can actually enjoy cookie dough without the risk of dying or the risk of diarrhea. So (laughs) that's where I went. And I did make, I have a, I have a thing for what's called the crispy cookie, the Tate's cookies in this area. I don't know if they're all the way out uh, on your coast. But Tate's cookies are a very crispy chocolate chip cookie. And that's what I made today. Buttery. Yeah, that was good. But I I really, I I would have eaten a whole thing with her. Absolutely. Chocolate chip cookie dough raw. (laughs) But that seems to be like uh, something pretty significant for you, right? It really was. And just talking about it right out of the gate, like you just start out, get me all misty already. (laughs) Yeah. That is such a fond memory because my mom was always baking. Like you said, she was always doing something, but cookies was really simple. And she did it a lot with us, the girls. And we would always, this was always tradition. We would always get a beater. So as soon as she was done, she wouldn't like let us go at the cookie dough, but she gave us a beater and we got to enjoy licking our beater. And that was the best time. And still 40 and 30 years later, I'll make 
cookies. Even when I'm making eggs and using my beaters, I'll always remember my mom giving me those. So cooking always reminds me of my mom and, and cookie, just chocolate chip cookies, just real simple, a great memory. And thank you for making me cry right at the gate. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> You have had that effect on people from time to time oh, yeah. for varying reasons. Yeah. So um, are we ready for the story that wasn't? Uh... Yeah. So if you if you'd like, I was hoping that maybe you could like tell us about your mom. Like, what was she like? Um, I know you said she was a pastry chef, but like, you know, anything like fun and cool you want to talk about, you know, before things went south. Yeah. She was very young when she had me. So she wasn't like a mom to me, like grandma was like you know grit like the adult fixture you know mom was 19 or 20 so I got to grow with her I feel like I mean when she needed to slam the hammer she was stern like you know but she she had a rough upbringing with her mother because there were six children and my mom got the short end of the stick a lot because her twin died and for some reason my grandma held it against my mom that the twin died and my mom and every one of the siblings will tell you this and all my mom's friends will tell you my grandma was really mean to my mom growing up so yeah. my mom made a point to be very lenient with her kids and be very hip very cool but still like when I got out of bounds or my sister like she'd slam the hammer but to made a point to always have fun with us to make childhood great to have a dog to have a cat to have the experience she needed to have made me read you know, always had me dolled up the newest clothes wanted to make sure I was popular made me watch Sabrina the Teenage Witch because she knew <laughs> that's what was trending and that's what was cool <laughs> Like I had no interest in Melissa Joan Hart like at the time I wanted to read like I was a book nerd but she made sure I watched that show and I was just <laughs> everybody wanted my mom to be their mom and you've seen pictures you ladies have seen pictures she's gorgeous yes. right yeah like she a was dynamo. Gorgeous. people flock to her she liked music like her and her girlfriend Swifty they'd always go down and, and listen to music there's going through all her pictures there's so many old pictures of concerts. Like, I don't know what I'm looking at, but I know that this is one of my mother's key memories in high school. And yeah, but after she had me, she definitely settled down and she had me young. So 1920, she became a mom and my dad didn't want me, didn't want kids. She'd had a couple abortions before me, but she, she knew she wanted me and she kept me. And that kind of like started to break up my dad and her. He was always like, you know, construction, out doing stuff. And he didn't want to be domesticated. And she did. Like, she wanted the life that she didn't have as a child. And that's kind of where that relationship broke down. And I remember my mom and my dad broke up when I was like three, four years old, that when she met another man that gave her the attention that she wanted and was the exact opposite of my dad. And his name is Russell Bennett Peterson. And he will be her boyfriend for the next seven years and the father of my little sister. And eventually, he will be the one that murders her and takes her life because 15% of homicides are done by the domestic partner. And that will be what happens to my mom. She'll become a statistic in 1993. And you're like, Nikki, it's 2023. Why are we talking about this now? Because he never went to jail. There was never any charges pressed. And I had to grow up without a mom. And it was really hard and, and nothing was ever done about it. And I think I had a midlife crisis at the age of 38 when I heard that they were actually reinvestigating and I was like, score, something's going to happen. And they did nothing for five months. I expected them to call me because I'm witness. I'm like, I knew it was active. I knew they were doing something, but it was like crickets. So finally I emailed the detective, found out it was transferred to another detective already, emailed her, chased her down, told her what I remember. And the email I got back from her was so brief and it was uh, to the, just to the point. It was, hi, Nikki, happy Thanksgiving. I'm glad you touched base with me. I've been meaning to reach out to you. Uh, you, you gave a brief synopsis. So you told me what you remember and basically it was nothing. You were sleeping. See you later. Like that's like a brief rendition of, of how I feel that conversation went. And I was like, wow, she says I'm sleeping and thinks that I have nothing to add to this. Like they literally don't want to interview me. And I knew that I had critical information and I sat at my desk and I knew that my life changed that morning, that I was going to have to do something. And I, I emailed her back and I requested the case file. And that was almost two years ago now, two and a half years ago. And my, my life has totally changed and I've become this advocate for justice. I was a pet sitter. I, I like to do dogs. Yeah. I know nothing about like true crime other than me watching it on TV, but now I'm living it. And it's, it's kind of surreal. 
that it's yeah. like me on the other side of the camera. Now, now I'm watching me on TV trying to get justice and it's an open and shut domestic violence homicide. I'm kind of not really sure where the breakdown in the investigation was. So that's why I'm blowing it open to the media. Like I'm showing everybody how Sedona police department let a murderer slip free for three decades and still is doing nothing. Boom. So let me ask I you so many questions. Yeah, me too. I'm like, my brain is like. <laughs> um, it's a lot, right? 30 let me years ask you a like question. How did you find out they reopened the case? Or how did they reopen the case? I found out in July of 2020, it was COVID. I'm a small business owner. I'm freaking out because I'm a pet sitter. And I get a call from my sister and we are like, we are kind of toxic. So I hadn't talked to her in a while. And I make Dustin take the call. Dustin's my boyfriend. And I was like, talk to my sister. And he's relaying the message. And he was like, hey, your sister's saying that they reopened your mom's case. Hey, your sister's saying, take this phone call. She's saying, get over it. Take the phone call. Like he's crushing and I'm being a snob. And I'm like, I don't want to talk to her. And I didn't talk to her. And that's the last time I've heard from my sister. And she agreed to initially help the Sedona Police Department and do like be a witness because she was or do a confrontation call. But then she fell off the grid. It's been over two years since the Sedona Police Department's heard from her and about two and a half since I've heard from her. I don't even know if she's alive or dead at this point. Is yeah. she his daughter? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's that's her dad. Yes. And How now does she poops. feel about that? Does she feel like he... Talking to her because he kept her away from us for, you know, very long time. So, so you I, went I, to go live with your dad and she went to go live with her dad. Yeah. Because there was no charges. He just got to continue living his life and he raised his daughter. And the night of the murder, my sister will keep repeating, puppy killed mommy, puppy killed mommy. And they won't tell me, I'm 10, but they'll tell me that, hey, your mom and Russell, they got into a fight. We've got to put you in this police car. And they put my sister in there and we waited in that cop car. And then in that cop car, for like 30 minutes, my sister just keeps doing this puppy killed mommy. And she's three, like almost four. She doesn't know what she's saying, but she's saying it with like this little like Looney Tunes, like puppy killed puppy killed mommy. And you can hear yeah. it on the 911 call. You can hear a little girl giggling. She doesn't know what she's seeing. She just knows something exciting happened. There's blood everywhere. Yeah, wow. she told me right away, like what happened. And the cops are lying to me. The adults are lying to me. I don't know what the hell to do. So you're 10 years old at the time. Yeah, I was three weeks before my 11th birthday. I'm born on July 26th. My mom died on July 9th. Oh, that was yeah. the most traumatic birthday of my life, my 11th yeah. birthday. Yeah. I and your sister was three at the time. Yeah, she's uh like like three like a week after me or something. She was born in August. She was almost four. It's just ridiculous. It's just yeah. So do you, can, what can you tell us about what happened that night? Well, yeah, you want to go into that, that or do you have more questions? Hold on, hold on one second. Please. How about go we ahead. start it from the beginning? Go ahead, you ask, go ahead, ask the question. Um, so, you know, maybe talk about how they met, you know, your mother and, and him and then, you know, and go from there. Go from there. Okay. So a, a, a rendition was, you know, she was breaking up with my dad and she met Russell. She, she was working in a restaurant called the Sheraton Crescent Hotel and she was doing her, you know, pastry chef things and that's when she met the, you know, a chef and executive chef jacket. And he's Italian and spoke fluent Italian. He was the exact opposite of my dad, where my dad liked to be outside and do construction. Russell liked to be inside cooking and being larger than life and speaking Italian and romancing my mom. And she felt hard, hard. And my dad was very hard to let go. And he started stalking my mom and Russell. I remember this. I remember my dad and Russell getting into a lot of fights, a lot of fist fights. My dad beating up Russell on multiple occasions. Russell was not a fighter. He was a lover, man, drinker, whatever. My dad did not like him. And that was even more reason to push my mom and Russell together. So, of course, that became a union. They did not get married. They did have a, a, a wedding set, but they did not get married, thank God. But they did have my sister about two or three years into the relationship in 1989. They will have my sister, and we will become, like, a happy family. Like my dad's a thing of the past. He's somebody that I kind of visit. I remember Russell and my mom and me and Christina having an apartment. That's when we got the dog, little family unit. And then they got the offer in Sedona to open a fine Italian restaurant. And remember my mom's like, you know, 29, 28, 29, 30. Like this is a big deal. She never went to college, lived in Phoenix her whole life. Sedona, Arizona is like the second biggest tourist attraction in Arizona. You got to have cheddar to live in Sedona. Okay. So the fact that they got this offer was huge and they extended them opening like he was going to be the executive chef and my mom was going to be the pastry chef. And this was just huge that her kids got to grow up in Sedona. So they jumped on it. 
They got a house, 530 Coffee Pot Drive. We rented this house. It was a two bedroom house. This is the first time I remember living in a house with Russell and my mom. I remember the house and I remember my mom loving it and being the homemaker and so proud and, and decorating and every holiday and dressing us up in the garden. She was always gardening and it was, she was very proud, but we never saw Russell. Russell was very proud too. He's a narcissist. He was very proud of that restaurant. And, and this is where the breakdown started with my mom and Russell's relationship because he started becoming obsessed with Pietro's. He was not only working 12 hour shifts, but he was going and drinking before and drinking after. And that's when he became a really bad alcoholic and started carrying around his water bottle. To this day, I'm pretty sure he still carries around a water bottle, but if you smell it, it's gonna have vodka because he's a really bad drinker. My mom just couldn't like, this was really bad. And my mom was like 30s. What do you need in your 30s if you're a woman? She started cheating. This is when I think she really started to make the decision to leave when she started cheating. And then, and then Russell decided to take some money and go out of town. This is now we're up to July 8th, 1993. This is the night of her murder, but you know, she'll be murdered in the wee hours of July 9th. So I always refer to her being murdered on the 8th because that's the last time I saw her. Question? Yeah. Was there any violence before that? Like, you know, big fights that you guys ever witnessed or anything? No, not really. I, like we were a happy little unit. She was happy because she was getting the attention she needed. There wasn't any stress until Sedona, till the restaurant and legit. I never saw the man. He was gone from sun up to sundown and that got old for her. And plus they're working together. That becomes contentious. And when she's just like, I'm just like my mother, you're, you're gonna know when she's unhappy. So all the coworkers know that they're, they were, had an unhappy relationship. So that's all over the case file because they interviewed all their coworkers. There's so much victim blaming in my mom's case file. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. So, so you, your mom was having like, a, she was having affairs. She started the, yeah, because she, you know, she still wanted to, she still wanted to make it work with Russell. Like on the night of her murder, she had gotten a babysitter for us because it was scheduled for us to like, not us ew <laughs> we're like her and russell to have you know adult time but the babysitter fell through because i think she had to work a shift and that's why my mom got off pissed about not getting some booty that night and then she's pissed because legit he's leaving to new york the very next day and he's taking some of her money that she saved this was a big deal to her this is what she bitched about on the phone all night long was that he was taking her money to ithaca new york but this is money she saved to take us to Disneyland. It was scheduled for the next month of 1993, August. It was the first time we were supposed to go to Disneyland. This was a big deal to take her kids to Disneyland, okay? This was a big deal. So when she got home, she's bitching about it. She's, the, the, the trip's gonna have to be put back or I'm, you know, I have to borrow money from grandma, blah, blah, blah. So she's bitching to Wendy about it. She calls Wendy, that's her first phone call. She starts drinking because in the case file, that's still something that they like to victim blame. My mom had a blood alcohol of 0.17. She didn't do any driving, wasn't going anywhere. A lot yeah. of victim blaming for her drinking. Anyway, so she starts drinking and venting to Wendy, telling her about how he's leaving with her money and she's unhappy and she's not getting any booty and he's a drunk. And the drinking was really bad because, you know, what happens with, with drinkers that... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I have another question. Question. Um, where was he going with her money? Ithaca, New York to a cooking seminar because he wants to be this superb chef so he wasn't good enough already running this being the executive chef of Pietro's he wanted to get some kind of certificate that's gonna was gonna cost like thousands of dollars and this is thousands of dollars in the 90s plus the trip like the cost of the trip oh my mom was pissed yeah pissed. he just took it without asking like he just took it you'd have to ask my aunt more about that because she my aunt vented I just knew as a little kid my mom was on the phone a bunch that night bitching and we kept getting yelled at, go outside, go to your room, be quiet, because she was mad and she was bitching to Wendy at first. And then after she's done bitching about all this to Wendy, she calls my dad at 8.06 and she proceeds to bitch to my dad. Now, if you look back at the phone bill, there are phone calls to my dad, but it's like five, 10 minutes because it's, it's about me, just the kid. Like, she doesn't just sit and chat with Craig because like Russell doesn't like Craig. Like it wasn't like they were buddies. But on this night, she does. She's upset. She's complaining to Craig about what she just told Wendy. And the difference, the difference, this is why everything just was like a, a recipe for disaster. 
my dad had been in a relationship since my mom left and Russell got together with this woman named Betty. And on this weekend, Betty had moved out. My dad was actually single. He had this big empty house. So when his ex Stacy calls and they're both drinking on both sides of the phone, he was like, just bring the, bring the girls back, bring Nikki and bring your other kid. We'll do it here. We'll start over. And like, that's legit how the phone, like I'm getting hot. That's how the phone call went. And then it went from let's do this to like dirty talk. And like my dad likes to go into detail about the things that my mom said to him. And I've had to tell him, please save it for the investigator. I don't need to hear how my mom yeah, wants to live real. with this and this. <laughs> like, yeah, my dad likes to like brag about it. And he was like, she was telling me about all these new things that she learned from this other guy. And I was like, <gasps> see, like my dad, like I get shaky because my dad is, is witness. He, he's one of the last people that she confided to about like her problems. And he is such a big key to the story. And he's been disregarded for 30 years. Anyway, my mom and my dad will make this. This is literally the motive for murder, ladies. My mom and my dad will make these plans. They'll talk for 107 minutes. My mom is happy after this. So when my aunt or my mom calls my aunt or my aunt calls my mom, they talk for a second time that night. In the case file, it is stated as saying, Wendy says the second time they talk, Stacy is happy. Wendy doesn't know why Stacy's happy. She just figured she had a good conversation with Craig because... Craig and Wendy, my dad and my aunt do not get along and still don't get along 30 years later. So my mom will never confide to Wendy the plans that she just made. But my dad will know. My dad will know for 30 years and my dad will tell me. My dad will repeat the same story for, I'm shaking, for 30 years. It's never changed. Okay, so she talks to Wendy. She's happy, right? I remember she gets off the phone with Wendy. I don't know, it's like 1030. My mom's a little tipsy. She's on the couch watching TV now. And it's around 11 o'clock and I come up behind her. We have a free floating couch. So I was able to come up behind her and do like a backwards hug. And I kissed her goodnight. I'm really, I've done this so many times that I could do it without sobbing. I kissed her goodnight. And she asked me if I brushed my teeth or I walked the dog. I remember she asked me something. I lied. I, I, I lied because I was busy fucking off while she was on the phone. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. And she, I went to bed. And that's the last time I saw my mom. Uh, and it's just, it's hard for me to like compartmentalize that. But it's the last time I saw her, I'll go to bed. And it's around 11 o'clock, July 8th, 1993. I'll drift off 11, 15, 11, 30, but I'll hear Russell come home, you know, the front door open, the dog barks. And that's the last thing I, rem <clears throat> the last thing I remember as a child. Fast forward, now it'll be three hours later, it's 2 a.m. We'll pick up to what I remember as a child and it's just black. And sounds will wake me up, but it's black. And I see the hallway light on and I see a shadow in my doorway. And I freak out because there's a weird shadow in my doorway. And I just start screaming. And then he fumbles because they're shining a flashlight at me because they can't find my light switch because the house in Sedona was a two bedroom house. So they converted the garage to my bedroom. So this is why I heard nothing, zero, zip. I was on the other side of the house in a garage, like down three steps, like in a basement level, like with two doors shut. So thank God I didn't hear anything, right? But the cops scared the fuck out of me. I'm like, I don't even think about my parents at first. I'm thinking the cops are there for me. Like, what I do? You know, you're 10. You're freaking out. They're like telling me to get up, get dressed. They're angry. They're rushing me. So I'm still freaking. Don't ask any questions. And they hustle me through my home so fast. And I just, my first impressions were, oh my God, it's so bright. Every light was on. And as I round through the kitchen, I see that there's right where my said goodnight to my mom is now, now Russell's sitting there. And He's not alone. There's like three cops standing around him and he's on the couch seat and he's, he's rocking and his hands were up and he's rocking and I don't know what's going on. And another cop is walking me through the house and trying to block me. And they just hustle me into the, it happened so fast. And they got me into the cop car, like I told you about, where they put my sister and my sister just keeps repeating what happened. And that's not what the cop man just told me as he put me in the car. He just told me that Russell and my mom got into a fight and my mom was at Aunt Kay's. And I was like, okay, I believed it. But then my sister's telling me this and we wait for like 30 minutes. My sister keeps doing this chant. Then they bring him out and they put him in the same squad car. And as an adult, I don't understand why they did that because he was suspect for murder. And they put the suspect in the car with the kids. And when he was in the car with us, now I'm going to cry. I was on the right side. And he was in the middle of me and my sister and he kept hugging me. And remember, Russell's not my dad. So it was really weird that he was touching me. He never touched me. He never, was never cuddly, cuddly feely with me. 
but he kept like just being really weird like I was like the first red flag like trigger like he's like hugging and touching me get him off me what the fuck and he keeps saying in my ear I'm so sorry and I want to keep the family together like really weird shit and that's when I knew that fucking something was really wrong because of that and then they took us to the police station and then I really knew something was wrong Oh, I need a timeout, so you have to ask me questions after that. Okay, take your time. So, yeah. Oh. Were there ambulances or anything? Like, it's so shocking that they didn't have, like, a female police officer there with you. Or, like, a, you know how now they have, like, services, like, within the yeah, police it's department? Like CPS or yes, somebody to, like, like, they would have called somebody for you. Be softer guys. with you. Right. Than the way they Nothing. I remember a lot of cherries and blueberries. I call that cherries and blueberries because as a child, it's just a lot of light. And as a little kid, I just, we were, we were parked in front of the garage. So I just saw a lot of lights. There's just a lot of squad cars with their lights going and it's, you know, two in the morning and it's very vivid whenever it's like, I, I, even when I don't do anything wrong and I'm pulled over, cherries and blueberries freak me out. Like cops yeah. freak me out. I bet. Yeah. So you're at the police station and I'm surprised that they would even put them in the car. It's the, also, it's the middle of the night. Like, it's just like. I don't know like the chaos yeah okay and then remember too this is Sedona Arizona now Sedona Arizona was ex or no Sedona Arizona Sedona Police Department was established in 1989 the year my sister was born that is like what what, what is that four years before like they mm -hmm. were only in they were they were the area was only po was policed by the Verde Valley Police. My point is, is they were very new police organization, yeah. like literally only a couple years old. My mom's homicide was probably one of the first homicides that they handled. I'd have to go back in the archives and look, but I mean, that's one of the, the FBI agent was very curious about that fact about them being a new police station and them just not being able to handle it. They they okay. thought the original investigation in 1993 they let him get away with murder by not taking you know gunpowder residue on his hand letting him sit in the clothes for a couple hours while they interrogated him not getting the phone bill subpoenaing the phone bill i mean the list goes on and on the missed opportunities and now the reinvestigation i think is just trying to cover up for the the lack of investigation in 93 but now the 2023 investigation my investigation there will be no cover-up there's no sweeping under the rug we're not going to just disregard my mother this is media. I will apply media pressure until they put press charges and they arrest him or until I die. There will be no end to this. It's not going back on a shelf, ladies. You'll hear from me for another 20 years if they haven't put any charges on him. Not going away. I waited 28 years before I tagged in because I wasn't ready. Now that I'm ready and I realized what they did and they had him, they had him and all the missed opportunities, like I'm gunning for them and the Yavapai County's attorney's office. At this point, I'm more mad at the police organizations that failed my mother than the man that murdered her in a crime of passion because he was a jealous narcissist. Yeah. Tell me why the Sedona Police Department and the Yavapai County's attorney's office keep jerking me off and my mother off. I mean, come on. Sorry, That's I get mad. I don't mean so, to yell. <laughs> so let's, for a second, so what, what caught me about your TikTok? So I, I found Nikki on TikTok as right. right as I tend to do. And what caught me about your TikToks is the 911 call. Oh. Um, yeah, that, that stopped me in my tracks. Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to try to pull some of the audio from one of your TikToks, if that's all right, to play yeah. at the end of the podcast, just so people can hear what it sounds like. I know recently on one of your TikToks, you said somebody was able to clean up some of the audio. Oh, but then see, they cleaned up only my sister. He emailed oh. me, but you don't hear the dispatcher. So you don't hear questions. You gotcha. just hear so it's really one-sided. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so in her TikToks, you can, she always plays a, a clip of it at the end right, and a lot of TikToks. And, and if you, uh, we'll link your TikTok to our episode so you guys can check it out in the show notes. She's got a ton of pinned videos at the top. So, you, you know, news footage and things that are really, really interesting that I think to the case that, you know, really, in my opinion, as just a lay person who does a podcast, who knows nothing about anything, um, he says he, he said it. it i i shot her he's like i guess know. i killed her. i yeah like it's talk about the the 911 call and what you think about it 
verbatim he says at the end of 54 seconds he says i might have she might have shot herself that's why i clipped that because it's 54 seconds into the eight minute phone call it is very crazy to listen to but it's right there in the in the middle where like you can tell that she's asking him and he doesn't know how to answer uh um i don't know and that's when he says i don't know i might have she might have shot herself like admitting that he, he there was a struggle like he even admits it but the point of that 911 call that I like to make a lot is that he doesn't make that 911 call right away. Instead, at 136 on the phone bill, he's calling his father in Glendale, Arizona. The lack um, of not calling 911 right away and calling your family members first after this accident is very suspect. And it's something also the Sedona Police Department have not investigated. The family had to find that. We just presented that information this last year. Like, it's just, it, it's bizarre to me. And Another thing that really makes me mad is that it it took my aunt 29 years to obtain that 911 call. I tried, you know, two and a half years ago when I started and I was getting the runaround from Sedona Police Department back to Sedona Fly- Fire Department. Nobody would give me an answer. And I gave up after a day. My aunt's been trying for decades. It wasn't until Fox News wanted to sit down with Sedona Police Department. And before a week before Fox News, because they had been they'd been pressuring Sedona for about a month, maybe two months for an interview. Finally, a week before that interview with Fox News, my aunt gets this great big packet in the mail and it's a printed copy of the case file and a zip drive. And on that zip drive is the recorded audio 911 and all of Russell's interrogations. Sure. So that's how Fox News got all that. But why did it take us getting a big news organization in almost three decades for the family to obtain it? Their excuse, they didn't have the right equipment. They were working with old technology. You're telling me my mom's case is the only cold old case from the 90s that required that flash technology for you to obtain? Really? You're a tourist town. You've got the cheddar. Really? Yeah. Wow. And it so, feels like, like a 911 call should be public record. Like, for real, you should yeah. be able to get a 911 call every time. Like, I don't understand. I mean, 1993 to now, you probably can get them now. 93 is probably yeah. a little trickier. But uh, but whose gun was it? Like, where did yeah. the gun come into, you know, come into the house? It was, it was definitely registered to Russell, given to him by his father. And it was definitely up in a very high, like, top closet. And my mom was not, like, a tall woman. And it was a let me for all of your gun listeners out there, guys. It is a 44 Magnum Ruger Red Hawk. That is a huge gun. So it's like a dirty, hairy gun. It's a bare defense gun. It's a revolver that requires two hands for the kickback. It is 13 inches from barrel to handle. The barrel alone is seven inches and it weighs damn near three pounds. His story is that my mother went into the bedroom, got a gun because I don't know, they got into the fight over my dad's phone call, right? That's what he claims. Right. And then she went into the bedroom. He, he neglects to mention what, you know, what else went into that, that phone call. But anyway, his story is that she went and grabbed the gun, went into the bed or went into the living room where he was sitting and said, and makes a statement, Russell, I'm going to shoot you. And then pops off a gun, a, a shot, and then turns around, I guess not waiting to see if she hit him. Because she turns right around to go in the room and shoot herself where he there and follows. First question is, what if you're just shot at, you you instantly chase somebody with a 44 Magnum Ruger Red Hawk. But he does. He does. And that's when he goes in there and they struggle over the gun and the gun went off. So he claims. I yeah. don't doubt, ladies, that they struggled over the gun and the gun goes off. But the fact is, who grabbed the gun first? Why is there a gun grabbed at all? Why would my mom be grabbing a gun? She's got her two kids in the house just planned to leave. The most dangerous time for a woman in a relationship or the end of a relationship is right when she plans, making the plan to leave. Yeah. Regardless, like, even if, even if just say she went and got the gun and even if there was a struggle, like, wouldn't he still be, like, responsible for manslaughter or involuntarily? Like, something. They're yeah. telling me insufficient evidence for the, re- the why they're not have why have, they have not prosecuted or pressed any charges. Insufficient evidence, and their, they've had that nine one one call all these years. Yeah, what is their position as regarding the nine one one call? Like what he says on the phone. He like, was confused. Like, oh, it, it could be shock. He was confused and could be shock is what they like to attribute all that to his he lack of memory because he changes his story several times. 
he goes to suicide and he goes to a struggle over the gun and but i mean you got <sighs> come on yeah i mean in the call the initially gun. in the call Sorry. in the parts of the call that you show he says um you know there's been an accident like the 911 office or the 911 dispatcher is like how many cars are involved and he's like no 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 not that kind of accident right like yeah. he's yeah. he's very like oh, not my. saying like if if you were like oh my god my girlfriend or my the wife the mother of my kids whatever she is to him you know say it, Dana. shot herself say it. or shot herself by suicide whatever he's claiming you know you think that you would be frantic or you think that yeah. you would be say it. you know he's too calm at least have some emotions right so where, where were the how many gunshots how many you know how how was yeah she so was there another shot in the room like right she supposedly oh shot my her. god you just did you're good go ahead we'll give you a minute oh my god this light <laughs> <laughs> technology is a nightmare oh jesus and this is what I, that's why i'm so jealous of your studio i see your studio and i'm like so jealous <laughs> and this we use studio I'm very very loosely here <laughs> <laughs> Come on. We've moved the studio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. They're falling. Don't fall. Okay. I'll ask you. I'll ask you. <laughs> <laughs> this is not happening. I'm gonna like hold it. I'm holding it now. So there we go. Okay. Hit um, me. So so was there, you know, his claims are that she shot the gun first and then went into the other room. Was there like ballistic evidence that there was a, a shot went off in the living room and that she was shot in the bedroom? Like, what about that? There is a shell casing, you know, retrieved from the front door area. Yes. And, uh, you know, ca casings and, you know, in the bedroom. Yes. But I mean, remember the altercation began at 115 and that's in the report and the Red Rock News is reporting 115. He's calling his dad at 136, not calling 911 until 140. He has lots of time to stage a crime scene yeah. like to you know to pop off that other shot because what really you know what happened what what my family and I believe happened is that he went and got the gun because he found out my mom was leaving leaving with his kid about the plans that she made that night he went and got the gun to intimidate her he's drunk you know he's a man he, he wants he wants to intimidate her. I'm the boss I don't yeah. think he planned on using it at all shooting it at all but he was going to get the gun out and be like you're not leaving with my kid but the thing yeah. is my mom is a fighter she saw a gun pushed the gun away probably started to struggle with the gun gun went off gun shot her right here like they struggled over the gun i don't doubt but he got the gun first it is his fault like he needs to pay the piper like even in yeah. the medical examiner report there my mom was right-handed there is no gunpowder residue on her right hand he claimed that she popped off two shots right but the gunpowder residue is present on her left and the medical examiner will state as defensive posture and positioning that is in the medical examiner. This is a homicide. They're going like against the medical examiner's report. Like a police station and a you know a county attorney are going in direct contrast to what the medical examiner is stating. Like here you go, put it before a grand jury, and essentially they're just going with what the suspect is saying. I don't understand that. I've never heard of that. This is if it wasn't my life, I would believe that it was fiction. So what she's explaining, you guys can't see in the video, is uh, she. You're saying she was shot in the neck. Mm -hmm. And she's right taking her left hand, which she's saying she's right-handed, right? So if she was, she would shoot a gun with her, her right, right hand, hand yeah. but that she's using her left hand to like probably push the gun up. So she's like putting her hand underneath her chin to like, and there's, so you're saying there's gunshot residue on her left hand. And, and the then, webbing. Oh my God. Come on. Come on. Right. right. So right. there wasn't any gunshot residue in her right hand, which is what Not she would have used to hold a very heavy gun. If you're holding a heavy gun, you're not going to use your left hand. Have you ever shot a gun? I have never shot a gun like that. And I, but I've held a, like a little pistol and yeah. the picture Cindy just showed us yeah. is like a fucking, that's a long, it's gun. like a Yosemite Sam, yeah. like Looney Tune looking motherfucker. Yeah. Like it's a long gun, like the big flag, like bang would come yeah. out of it. Like it's yeah. comical how gigantic it is. Yeah. yeah. And comical. So, yeah. It's huge. And like, so I picked up just a little pistol one time. I found it at a job I was working at. Wow. And I was like, yeah, I was like, oh my God, there's a gun here. I'm going to pick it up and hold it. Like, <laughs> That's <laughs> smart. <laughs> and it was fucking heavy and it was little, you right. know, like it's shocking how heavy it and was. And there's a kickback. There's I mean, like I didn't shoot kickback. it, but yeah. There is a kickback. And what's 
I've I've shot with a Glock and it, I've used two just for steadying for yeah and I know it wasn't heavy it's very lightweight compared to what this one looked like yeah mm -hmm. wow so well, did let you me try ask you to help her for for the person that did shoot Cindy right yeah. yes would you shoot that Glock you said you used two hands would you do it with one hand. No, no. However, the person I was training that was teaching me, she was she was doing it with one hand, but that's because she was actually training herself to do it with one hand and just in case. And not she only to. She probably wasn't even doing it with her not dominant hand. Right. She was yeah. actually she was actually switching okay. between the two hands, uh, but okay. she wanted to, but right. again, she had she been like training, training yeah. for years right. and her mother she's not a mom of two kids that's right yeah. 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 You know, yeah. her that's mom is actually a sharpshooter so she's been around it for a long time so gotcha. she was training me just in the basics and i was like she she was giving me all the safety things and i'm like yeah let me steady myself with two because yeah. there is a kickback even with a light nine millimeter yeah and versus this thing is massive so massive. they 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 called it a suicide. He's claiming nobody's called it a suicide except the suspect. Let me let me clarify because my aunt gets really mad when when we talk about suicide. But I mean, we got to talk about it because that's what the suspect is saying. Right. Now, the cause of death is officially a homicide. The suspect Good is God. claiming that it's a suicide. You know, she went to go get the gun first. Right. It was like a murder suicide. And they went the, there was a struggle over the gun. And then when he is interrogated three months later, he says that he was standing away from her and that it was a complete suicide. He changed the story all the way to suicide because it's, it's an evolving story because he's had time to think about it. Yeah. So the case was never closed. It's still an open click case, right? They just don't have enough to convict him. Correct. They, they the, keep it as an open investigation, but how they, they jerk us around with um, it, keeping it inactive. They don't work on it. They don't do anything about it. it they, they, talk, they call it a review phase. Right now, my mom's case is in a review phase because I wrote to Sedona City Council and you know, pitched the fit. Otherwise, she'd still be sitting on a, on, a, on a shelf collecting dust. Like, they don't want to do anything about this 30-year-old case because it's going to co cost money. And they don't want to put any money into it. They should have done it 30 years ago because I'm going to cost them a whole bunch of money. Right. Now, you mentioned the FBI. Is the FBI is now involved? No. So my aunt and I, we started the campaign to writing to everybody last summer. We wrote to the Yavapai County attorney who's supposed to be prosecuting. We wrote to the attorney general, all three offices that he has in Arizona. And the, uh, the attorney general did get back to us with um, a complaint sheet. And he was like, your complaint is best served with the DOJ. So we sent that same packet to the DOJ. The Department of Justice sent an FBI agent to my aunt's house, to the return address was like, hey, what's up? We got your packet. Sounds like something that we're interested in. What do you want us to do? And my aunt was like, oh my God. Thank I remember we were elated. This happened in June of last year. It was right before the Fox story aired. So we were like, yes, the FBI is getting involved and the Fox story is going to be aired. Hell yeah. We're done. We don't have to do anything, right? No. <laughs> Really? No, no, no. The FBI went up to the, the, the Sedona Police Department little station and was like, hey, what's up with this case? And Sedona Police Department said, hey, nothing's up with that case. We're good without you. Peace out, FBI man. Basically, the FBI is a federal institution. If the Sedona Police Department does not invite them to investigate, the Sedona Police Department doesn't have to let them in. They have Get to be the invited. The, 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 yes, my frustration. I was yelling at the FBI like I'm yelling at you. Because I was so, and I'm not yelling at you, just I'm projecting because I'm frustrated. This yeah. is how I was yelling at him because I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I spent all year. What do you mean? I just wrote you this pack. I got you here. And you're telling me you can't do anything? No, they can't do anything. Anything. Media applying this, this is the only thing that works talking to you and you putting it out there. Yeah. Wow. I know. Wow. You I know, never I, thought I, I've, I've listened to, to enough uh, true crime stories to know that, yeah, the FBI has to be invited. You would think that the fam, like, and I know this is like a utopian thought process, right? right. But like, the, the cops work for you. You're the, you're the one that pays their salary. Like, if I want this investigated by a different bureau, like, it should be like a law that that's what the fuck happened? I've gotten like, no crazy. compassion from anybody in the Sedona Police Department. Have you read the letter that they sent us? 
I have not. No. Oh, it's a part of my mini series, part seven. It's got over a hundred thousand views. I it got very upset when we received a five paragraph letter from the Sedona police department. I'll send that to you. So okay. if you want to highlight that and read it on your, on your podcast, you can, because I had the famous lady, Rady Robinson from uh, dog, the bounty hunter. I had a podcast with, she straight told me that that letter from Sedona police department was gaslighting. And I agree. Like I was very upset the day that I opened up that letter. It was five paragraphs, essentially telling me my mom's case was inactive, telling us that they did a whole bunch telling us that there's nothing they can do if the suspect's not willing to talk. They can't pull them in for interrogation because it's, it's been too long. The fourth paragraph was addressing harassment, how my aunt is harassing them by calling them and asking them what's up, and I'm oh, harassing them via my TikTok channel. They literally, they are threatening that I, they're going to put press harassment charges on me. I was asking the Sedona Police Department to do their job. The way I have been treated and my aunt has been treated by the Sedona Police Department, it blows my mind. I want the world to know there has been no compassion. The way, and I get so upset from the day I received that first email, her stating that she didn't want to talk to me because I was sleeping. I held that, that, that important evidence I just told you about my dad for 30 years. I read the case file and I read to my part of my dad's interview in the case file. And I was thinking to myself, this isn't what my dad has said for 30 years. So I know that the cops didn't properly interrogate. I know what my dad told me that they, he had one interrogation or interview over the phone. They, they let so much slip and they have the nerve to treat me like, a, a, like I am a suspect, not a victim here. I am so upset with the Sedona Police Department. I haven't even gotten a chance to get to the Yavapai County attorney yet because I'm still tearing the Sedona Police Department apart. I want everybody to know. So I'll send is you there that. Is there any way that you could go over their head? This is going over their head. The people that they have to answer to are the taxpayers and the citizens of Sedona, Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, I don't know what else to, to like, do. You know, there's so many cases like yours, like especially with domestic violence. And I, I feel like any crime against women, crime against women gets a lot of uh, brush up under the, the rug yeah. from police departments. You know, not all the time, but especially police departments that aren't like capable of handling these big cases, you know, and they just get the runaround. And but like, the thing is, the thing that like boggles the mind, in my opinion, is just, it seems the fucking medical examiner saying it's homicide. Right. He says on the phone, the 911 call that he did it. Maybe he did it. He didn't know if he did it. Blah, blah, blah. If it's a homicide, there were two people who had their hands on the gun that night. And one of them is not alive. Like, this is open and shut. Like, wouldn't you, as a police department, want to be like, we got him. Good job, guys. And put him in jail. Like, exactly. it just makes I don't sense. know where the like, What's the is. point? Because, because, you know, the, thing is, the thing is um, that a lot of times, like, you have the uh, the prosecutor. They won't, they won't take it to court because it's not a clear win for them. Yep. And um, what they want is they want, a, like, a nicely padded case yeah. with lots of evidence so that they, it's a, a open and shut case you well, know what i, I, mean? I, I so get that but doesn't even win. sound like it's ever even gotten to the prosecutor like they sounds- submitted they submitted my mother's case twice for prosecution but they're not submitting the whole case it blows my mind they're submitting six pages of a 10 page autopsy i want a whole case presented to the Yavabai county attorney or a grand jury for that matter yeah. like i like i said i'm still tearing apart the sedona police department because they're both pointing fingers at each other Because the Yavapai County attorney had their own investigators on my mom's case that night. The person that interviewed my interviewed my father was a Yavapai County investigator. I don't know who's corrupt or where it is, but I'm pretty much it. I I I think it's Yavapai County, but I I haven't gotten that far yet. I'm going to rip them both apart if they don't do something. I just don't know for the for the better good of everybody. Shut me up. Do some investigating because I will be a megaphone. For the rest of my life. And if I suspiciously die, you two, you three better be looking into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here's the thing. What are some private here's the thing that, well, here's the thing that, that confuses that I think that somebody listening to this not knowing, there's a difference between her saying her dad, which would provide the motive for the crime, and the boyfriend, which was the the, the killer. Um, how was the how was the interrogation with the boyfriend? What did he say uh, under interrogation? There are three different interviews with him and he changes his story so much. I mean, even in the Fox News story, they say that they, they present snippets of it. I mean, he's all over the place. He's all over the place. He doesn't know what to say, but the, no, the fact is, is like... that they essentially just gave up. 
they gave up in September of 93. That was the last interview they had with him. And they, they were canceling scientific examinations on the weapon, the gun, by October, three weeks after the suspect brings in the phone bill that shows that he's a liar and is calling other people before 911. They let him bring that in, missed opportunity. Then three weeks after that, they're canceling examinations on the weapon. They just gave up. It just, just started giving up, like throwing in the towel. And by, by 94, they were done. There was no more investigating for decades. It's sloppy police work, really. Yeah, very it's really sloppy police work. Now, did they try to question your sister? Yeah, they did. They interrogated her that night as a four-year-old. And in her in the case file, she's stated as telling them at least 13 times that Poppy killed mommy. But the investigator saying, telling her, no, that's not what you saw. Like, if you want me to send you the case file so you can, like, go over the, like, 10 pages of her her, her interview, it's very devastating. It, I won't read it anymore. I've read it out loud before. I won't do it again. It's very hard to hear because she's four and she's very candid. She doesn't, she doesn't know what she just saw, but she's very like, this is what I just saw. Papa yeah. killed mommy. He did it. He grabbed the gun. He put it back up in the closet. She sees that. So Russell has to, you know, has to, he has to tell the investigators that he grabbed the gun and he put the gun up because his kids saw that. Like she saw everything. But then a year later in 94, when we see her, she'll tell me that mommy killed herself. She's so brainwashed. Yeah, they're easy to convince, you know. Little yeah, what does she know that she think? What does she think she saw? She's a little, what the fuck do you remember from four? You know what I mean? Right. Did they Someone question? Um, like, yeah. Did they question your aunt Wendy and um and your dad, your your at dad that you know that they 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 were planning to to leave? Yeah, my dad's only got a half of a paragraph of an interview via telephone. My father tells me that they called him. My dad tells me that he stated exactly what he told me for 30 years, what I just told you. In the case file, that, that's not what the interview says in the case file. It's very shocking. And that's when I knew something was up because my dad's story, girls, has never changed. Never. So I, like, if you want me to send you the case file, yeah, this in investigator was like just way off base. My dad just had an interview with Sedona Police Department. Like after I got them to like have reactivate it in J January, I had my interview on January 24th with them. They came down in February, drove down here and interviewed my father at his home. Finally, after 30 years, he got to tell Sedona Police Department about what happened that night. What they're doing with the information is anybody's guess. Anybody's guess. It's That's active. So yeah, it years. just doesn't make, like, I'm just like, but why? I mean, it makes sense to me because sloppy police work is sloppy police. Well, I understand why, like, now to be like, oh, covering up because you're co-workers fucked up and you don't want to get them in trouble but like in the right. beginning like why because like that's the goal right like you're the hero you got the bad guy like yeah but you're see you're working with people see like in an institution police police work and i'm not i, I don't know but i know enough police yeah. yeah they cover for each other because you don't want to yeah. be blackballed i get that, sure, I get that. Yeah. so if somebody did sloppy police work especially these newbies probably yeah. on the job yeah. did sloppy police work and you're the one to uncover that are you going to be the one to like say yeah this is this is how we messed up yeah i, I see your point i I mean, I see you. See what I'm saying? I do, of course. Is that's, why, that's why I wonder if there's somebody, uh, uh, um, an institution above them right. that polices the police. Well, that's what I'm saying. You like, know? what about a private investigator that right. goes around and gets all that? Then, you, you know, of course, they'd have to pay that's for that. Money. But yeah. it's money, right. Exactly. Which is bullshit. But right. Tell me who to reach out to. I, I have exhausted. I, all, yeah. I've reached out to everybody. And this is the only thing that makes moves mountains is talking to media. Talking yeah, to you guys, I mean, getting the next podcast. Uh, you know, getting a little bit of media pressure, really like, look at what happened. We got the 911 call after almost three decades. Yeah. You know, that Fox thing scared them. So if I can get more big media, then, you know, Sarah Turney just had, I had my interview with Sarah Turney last week for Voices for Justice. And yeah. she, she emailed Sergeant Leon for comment. And Sergeant Leon is taking media comments. Like, good. So, yeah. So that's huge. But she knows, the point is, is that she knows that there's more media, lots more media. I'm not going away until yeah. this is solved. So what's next, Nikki? I want charges, girl. I will not give up till there are charges. And then I, 
after that, I don't know. We're at a precipice where my life doesn't exist. I'm at a standstill. Like it is only this and like dog rescue. The way I get through life like is going to the dog rescue. And then I'm able to come and blog and true crime and write more letters. And who do I got to contact and what media? But after, do, what do I do afterwards? I've devoted the last couple of years. Do I do a podcast like you guys? Do I become a victim's advocate? Yes. I don't yes. know. So I don't that. know. I have no idea what happens for me because there is no after until there's an arrest. I won't even think about it. Is there a documentary that she got picked up for a documentary, right? <laughs> I am so happy to announce on your podcast that 314 Bird Studios is producing a true crime documentary on my mother's murder. That's More so media. Yes. Great. Thank That's you, awesome. Mr. Bird, for yes. producing that. I cannot wait till that comes out. That's going to be a long endeavor, but his last... um. His last true crime doc won a, a awards. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. yeah, that's that's you know, you are so like, I mean, she posts all the time and she's always has updates and she every day she has something to say. And really, like, as difficult as that must be, really seems like you gain traction in a way. Like when I initially talked to her, we were like one of the first people she was talking mm -hmm. to. By the time we got to record with her, she's already recorded with 12 other podcasts. I like, know. I mean, you are really an advocate for your mom in a way that is shocking. Like it's, it's really impressive. I've gotten very lucky the last eight weeks. Nothing has changed. I have done nothing different other than I had one video go viral and some, some people saw me. So but yeah. this is what I've done from the get -go. try to get people to, to listen. Getting heard is the most painful and most frustrating thing as when you're starting out. Like, I, right. so if I could ever get big enough, I will help other people that have nobody, no media. I will help you. I will be that wind beneath you yeah. because I know how it feels having nobody listen. I'm getting sweaty now because I get so emotional. So <laughs> all the people that have helped me, like, thank you, God. Thank well, you, if Mom, I can make a suggestion, I you should start a podcast because, um, I mean, it's you know, it's yeah, you it's have. a way to get your voice out, help others, and in the in the same in the same vein, maybe get some help for yourself. Yeah, you know. So um, there's two other women that I think I want to do a trio like you. We wouldn't be <laughs> in the same room, but I think it would be great. I, we've already thought about it. It's just, it's a lot right now, but I think maybe yeah. that is my future. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we're gonna wrap it up, yeah. and um, because I wanted to, I wanted to offer something off the record. Okay. Um. So how do we wrap it up? Um. I guess with the with the. So look, be on the lookout. For, yeah, for her TikTok. Yeah, and um, then if you want to tell us, any, well, she'll she'll do like a yeah. little closing. But if if you want to tell us anywhere, people can like, you know, get in touch with you or you know follow your TikToks or any of your other socials. Yeah, so I'm what gonna if we, what if like people I guess no, never mind. I was gonna say, is it like good to have other people like it's not I guess it's not like calling a politician, right? To like bother the police department, but you know what I mean? Like if people are like, Why aren't you doing this case? Why aren't you doing this case? Why aren't you doing this case? Yeah. Um, but I don't know if that's a thing that she wants to get with the news. But I have I have a suggestion for you, but I wanna talk about it off the uh Sure. podcast because it would be stupid for me to promote another podcast, <laughs> another podcast. But, um, okay. there's a podcast that I think we should talk to but um but first I'm going to do the wrap up okay um okay. Nikki, it's been a pleasure talking to you I'm so glad that you're finally going to get a documentary about this case I would watch the shit out of that yeah, we Sorry. definitely will um it sounds like a solvable case it sounds like it was sloppy police work and it sounds like you got your work cut out for you um so where can they find you Nikki Okay, so my TikTok, like Dana keeps bringing up, I do do daily updates. That's the fastest and best place to keep up to date, like in current time. But we finally got a website up, guys. Rainy Robinson helped me get a website, www.stephaniewassolution.com. And that's going to have all the autopsy paperwork. All the 911 call will be there. All my media links to every single podcast, yours included, will be on this website in the near future. So just keep an eye on my TikTok page and keep an eye on that website is the best way. So I just thank everybody for helping me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, That's incredible. You're welcome. That's yeah, great. You're, really, doing, you're doing you're really doing so good. good. So, yeah, yeah, for real. And you really should start a podcast. It's a lot of fun and a lot of work, but <laughs> it's also a lot of work. Anyway, uh, that's it for us, and we'll talk to you next week. Yeah. In the meantime, don't get taken to that second location. Be good or be good at hiding a body. All of these will be linked. We'll have all the links. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>